So yesterday I start speaking about basic techniques in parameterized algorithms and today I will speak about concern notion kernels which started or we started to develop as a technique but some, at some moment people realize that this is actually a direction which is interesting on its own and while still it's strongly connected to parameterized complexity uh, you can view it also as a sub area of polynomial time algorithms but this is a very important and interesting technique so I will spend two lectures on kernelization and kernels so I will speak uh, my plan for today I will speak what is a kernel I will give a simple examples vertex cover point line cover H click cover that will be and if I start speaking about polynomial kernels exponential kernels and then actually I will prove you the only theorem that FPT is exactly kernelization and then uh, I will start uh, moving to more interesting and more advanced techniques and I start speaking about sunflower lemma and give uh, two examples how to apply sunflower lemma for kernelization for the heating set and for the set packing okay so what is a kernel right if you make a search in Wikipedia so everything is called kernel right so I will not be speaking about kernels in image processing, kernels in operating systems. So that will be kernel in a parameterized technique for designing efficient algorithms. But be careful because uh, kernel means uh, in every area of uh, mathematics or algorithms there is a kernel, right? So it's a what? It's a different. Okay, so this is a. And uh, again, so if you look from the philosophical perspective, what is a kernelization? So this is the quote of Michelangelo Buonarroti, who was saying that every block of stone has a statue inside it, and it's the task of the sculptor to discover it. So this is exactly the same. I have a huge data, and I'm a sculptor, and I really want to find out a small but very meaningful thing in this big thing or to compress this data or just to find something which is inside so this is uh, the quote and just uh, let's try to see uh, what is uh, pre-processing because kernelization is uh, usually regarded as a tool to analyze certain uh, pre-processing techniques so those of you who are familiar with chess so this is a chess problem so the white should mate black in two steps anyone sees the solution Right, so the solution here is if you're experienced, well, a little bit experienced in chess, so the knight should go from uh, d5 to uh, a, this is a, okay, I'm not, so to e7, right? So then the king should move here or here, and then the white rook finish the business. Okay, but let's just try to analyze how our brain works, or just at least how we come to the solution. So there are a lot of pieces on this board, right? But somehow, when uh, I tell you the problem, at least to me, mentally, I start to concentrate on something happening around the black king. Right? So, a lot of, there are a lot of pieces, but most of them are actually irrelevant. And actually, so at least uh, uh, when you start thinking about this problem or try to find a solution, so the usual thing is just to concentrate on something which is meaningful. And then forget about uh, everything which is, uh, seems to be relevant. Is it possible to formalize such type of things? I don't know. Because even uh, the way uh, we think about the chess problem, different people think in different ways. And what is relevant, what is irrelevant, it's hard to say, right? But still it's a kind of example of how our brain is doing pre-processing. Okay, more, uh, how say, uh, understandable example how things work sudoku right is there anyone who never did sudoku okay don't, i don't have to explain the rules right what's happening and also when you start uh, well uh, when you start solving sudoku you you quite fast come with some reduction or rules or how to fill the for example uh, and there is actually if you look at the internet there is a lot of different reduction rules or prospect processing rules for sudoku so, for example, there's a uh, cross-hatching uh, rule, for example. So, what's happening here? Cross-hatching rule, you just uh, try to uh, identify the only possible posi uh, situation for one here. For example, I have one here, I have one here. So, one crosses this column, 
one crosses this column and one crosses this row. So the only place uh, for uh, to, to fill this table or to, to, to fill this cell of the table is for one. So, and uh, what is the beauty of uh, Sudoku? Yes, you have a lot of uh, preprocessing uh, rules, but still, so the interesting cases, you're not able to solve with the preprocessing rules. But at least it's now it's more easier to formulate what will be my preprocessing, right? For example, I am using cross-hatching rule as a preprocessing rule and then doing. And actually what people are, you know that Sudoku is, uh, well, Sudoku cannot be anti-complete because it's a nine. Uh, or uh, it's nine by nine, right? But if you generalize Sudoku to infinite uh, uh, boards, then it's NP complete. And actually, what uh, I, I've heard people were doing operation research, so they do in preprocessing, and after that they plug in uh, integer linear program, and this solves Sudoku with this uh, type of approach. And here, okay, so here reduction rules are much more clear. But can we say anything meaningful? For example, uh, so we are doing, we're trying to do, so to build some rigorous analysis of algorithms. Can we say something meaningful? For example, if I'm doing my reduction rule, then at least 25% of uh, cells in the table will be filled. This sounds a, a bit strange, because let me just, uh, yes, uh, but uh, I will come back to this question so once again. And again, so, so if you start speaking about preprocessing rules, so if you did some programming, preprocessing rule is the first thing you have to do, right? Because it's uh, simple, it never hurts, and sometimes it can solve the problem, and if it doesn't solve the problem, it can simplify the problem a lot. And uh, of course, the commercial uh, linear program solvers like Cplex, they're using preprocessing, navigating systems, whatever, just pick any application, there will be preprocessing there. Okay, but uh, we want to see, so what I want to see, uh, how to analyze NP-complete problem and preprocessing done for NP-complete problem, right? And just let's take a very naive approach. I take uh, my favorite NP-hard problem, say I take satisfiability. And then for satisfiability, I'm asking, is there a preprocessing algorithm that guarantees to reduce every instance of the problem, say by one or five percent? Is this possible? Just think about it, right? We have an NP-complete problem, and we have an algorithm which reduces its size a little bit. I run this, okay, for, like for SAT, I run the algorithm and this is, gives me a new equivalent instance with one variable less. Sorry? If that is true, then you can do it repeatedly. Yes, so I can do it, in, then I can solve SAT in polynomial time, right? And that will be a, yes, great thing, right? Again, but, yes. So, at first glance, uh, there's no hope to analyze, uh, to, to, to provide any reasonable uh, algorithmic uh, theory which is able to analyze preprocessing algorithms, right? But let's just take another, take a look. Slightly different. Okay. Okay, so at first glance, there's no interesting theory here. Let's look at the following toy problem. The problem is the following. I have a plane, and on a plane, I have n points. Now, uh, and also I, I am given integer k, and now I ask if there are k lines which cover all points. So on this example, this is a set of points, and here I have one, two, three lines which cover all points. Right? So this is, believe me, this is an NP-complete problem. So it's, it looks, uh, as a toy problem, it looks simple, but it's an NP-complete problem. Uh, okay, so what is uh, I can do? So first of all, of course, I can uh, always assume that uh, I have at most n square lines, right, to consider, because uh, I have n points and every line, so I just take all possible, all lines which go in through two points, so in total, I just can uh, view this problem as a finite uh, problem, so I have n at most n square lines, and I just have to pick up at most k out of them. Right, this is uh, make things a bit easier. Okay, and uh, as far as I realized that, well, I can have a reduction rule. The rule is the following. If there is a line which covers more than k points, this line should go into the solution. Why, right? Because if there is a line which covers k points and I don't put this line into the solution, each of these points should be covered by another line and I'm run out of budget. This is exactly the same argument I was using for vertex cover, if you remember yesterday. 
right? Okay, so then uh, my reduction rule will be well, I construct a new instance. So if I found a line which covers uh, more than k points, what I'm doing, I remove all these points from my instance and I reduce my parameter by one, right? And this rule is sound. Okay, so let's see. So I am applying this reduction rule. So this reduction rule can, can be clearly done in polynomial time. And I, at each step of the reduction rule, I obtain an instance with a smaller number of points. Okay, so what's happening? So when I cannot find a line anymore, right? So when this can happen? First of all, this can happen so there's no points left, right? This means that I already solved the problem. We are done. Or... Maybe I run out of budget, so my uh, parameter becomes uh, zero, which means that I won't be able to cover, I don't have any budget to cover any more points. I say no in that right situation, that I cannot cover lines with the key, uh, points with key lines. Or we arrive at the problem, so-called irreducible instance, right, where I cannot apply reduction rule anymore. Right? What can I say about this Irreducible instance. Okay, let's let's see. So uh, in this instance, uh, I uh, so there's no line which can cover more than k points. And uh, what does it mean that if I have a yes instance, this yes instance should contain at most k square points, right? Every line now can cover. So if I have more than k square points, uh, points, and uh, if uh, my uh, instance is irreducible, I just say no, right? Otherwise, I have at most k square points. Because every line covers at most k points now. And I know that yes instance should contain at most k lines. So k times k is k square. Yeah, and this is a... Okay, so let's just uh, try to reflect what we just did. So, I have a polynomial time algorithm, right? Every reduction runs in polynomial time. And in polynomial time, I have a parameterized instance of a p-complete problem. So, this is, was a number of points and a parameter k. And I constructed an equivalent instance, p prime, k prime, of the same problem, right? And such that the size of the, so the number of points here is bounded by a function of k only. Really, so it uh, becomes a really game changer. So when I was speaking about an p-complete problem and I was just uh, taking parameter at the input lens, I was not able to say anything about my preprocessing algorithm. And as far as I started, I started to speak about parameterized problem, I can say something about uh, the result of preprocessing. Right. So this is a. Okay. So the formal definition: of what is a kernel so just uh, but that will be the only formal definition so let's go slowly through this definition and that I promise that will be the most how say, boring part of this lecture but we, it, it's better to define so it's it's properly okay so I have some preprocessing algorithm and what I mean by preprocessing algorithm so the input of the algorithm is a instance of parameterized problem so it's again it's a it's an instance and this is the parameter so it's a, a receive as a string and then it constructs an equivalent instance of the same problem, but uh, the instance is different, right? And by equivalent, I mean, what, what I mean? I mean that if this is, if these strings belong to this string belong to the language, if and only if this string belongs to the language, this is a yes instance. If and only if this is a yes instance. Okay. And uh, the new thing, so which is not usual for normal algorithms, I define the output size of the algorithm. Right? So before, the, so when we just look at, at normal uh, 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 algorithms, so what we usually care, we care about the running time of the algorithm. Right? This is a normal thing. Now, I speak about preprocessing, and I also speak about the size of the algorithm. So what is the size of the algorithm? The size of the algorithm is uh, just uh, as a function of k, of the parameter, is the supremum of uh, the size of the compressed instance plus the parameter right and this is the, the, the and this is the instance which is outputted by the algorithm so just uh, the question why i want to have supremum here so why i cannot have maximum here in this definition hmm? 
Exactly, yes. So if my algorithm, for example, if, um, if, if my algorithm uh, always outputs something which size uh, uh, cannot be bounded by a function of k, right? So then in this, this definition will tell me that the size of the kernel is infinity. The only reason why I need Supremo. Very good, yeah. Okay, and now the kernelization algorithm, or simply people use jargon, a kernel, for parameterized problem is algorithm. So it takes uh, instance, uh, out walks in polynomial time, and then uh, returns an equivalent instance. And also we require that the size of the equivalent instance, the size of the output, is bounded by some computable function g of k. So you're missing the, the size of size a k is not either should be either this the size <coughs> k should be, those depend of i also no? uh, you refer to to, to this part yeah no, no, the definition the definition size a i, 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 I don't understand so the, the question you say double size of, of uh, this size? No, 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 no. This is this is exactly the point. So uh, I so the, so I want my algorithm. So the size depends only on k. Sometimes it's impossible. I don't say that it's always possible. But if it's impossible, if I have algorithm which doesn't does this, then I say that the size of the kernel is infinity. Yeah. Yes. No, why do I have a K prime? Because like an uh, example with this uh, point line color, right? I have a parameter, uh, I have an instance points and parameter. But when I start to, to, to run algorithm on my problem, I also change the parameter. <laughs> Yes, uh, no, 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 because now I, no, 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 no because now I, I really want to output, uh, so the size of, 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 of the size of my problem as a function of the parameter. And if I, so, for, okay, so like, a, okay, so, like, a, so I, so here I, I have example, so I have a kernel which contains k square points, right? If I view it as a binary, then I will have my kernel of exponential size. And at and, and some moment it will be important for me. So, uh, okay, so, so if I understand your question correctly. So why I require binary and unary? Because uh, in, in, in a few minutes I will start distinguishing between kernels of polynomial size and exponential size. Right? But you're right, Marcos, for this definition, for this definition, I don't need a binary or a unary. I don't care, right? Because it's just a function of k. Yeah? No, but that's a, that's a good question. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah? yeah? Uh, which equality? This one? This one? No, no, I just explained what is a I prime and K prime. What is a I prime? And I prime and K prime is just an output of the algorithm. I have algorithm and then I just take a, a supremum over all outputs of the algorithms for, for this value of K. So I fix K and I consider all possible inputs. Right? I can I fix k and I can see the all points so with n, uh, so n, n goes arbitrary, and then still I estimate the size just as a function of k. But this is a can k prime. Uh, okay, this is some number. So usually, usually this number when you have reduction rule, this number decreases. But formally, you can have some uh, strange reductions where this k prime can grow. So the only thing, the only thing I want that uh, this plus this uh, is at most some function of k. So so far, just think about k prime is something which is smaller than k. But in this definition, it's not true, and there can be examples of re re reduction re reductions where the parameter is growing. You reduce the size of the input, but the parameter is growing. Could be. This is a Yes. Uh, okay. And then is uh, the definition of uh, so when uh, the size of uh, output of algorithm or a kernel is polynomial in K, we say that A is a polynomial kernel, right? And then uh, so the size of the uh, yes. So the, the way we define the size of the kernel is in number of bits of the input 
or of the, of the, of the size of the, in the bit size. But it's very often, uh, it's uh, quite convenient also as an, uh, when we speak about uh, algorithms, also to specify. For example, if uh, my kernel outputs a graph, Sometimes it's very interesting also to know not only what is the size of the graph, right? So what is the length of the encoding of the graph, but also how many vertices or how many edges are there, right? So how many variables and how many clauses are there? So, so very often we also pronounce this explicitly. Right? So this is a... Oops. Okay, so now uh, as far as we define what is a kernel, now I can state the theorem, right? That point line cover admits a polynomial kernel with k square points. Right? So polynomial runs in polynomial time and outputs uh, something of size polynomial of k. Okay, let's come back to our uh, favorite problem, vertex cover, and uh, why vertex cover is our favorite. I probably really realize it. It's the simplest problem in parameterized world. So if I have any new technique, of course, it's the best way to demonstrate this new technique on vertex cover. And for vertex cover, once again, so I have a graph, and I want to find a set of uh, at most k vertices, which hits every edge, or which covers every edge. And uh, actually, uh, if you remember my first lecture, so the first algorithm for vertex cover, so which I called bus algorithm, actually it's already a polynomial kernel. So let me just go through it again. So vertex cover admits a kernel with k square edges and k square <coughs> plus k vertices. Okay, so how the proof is, I, I have an instance g of k. Again, I just uh, delete all vertices of degree zero. This rule is okay, right? Vertices of degree zero, they don't cover anything. I don't need them. And then if uh, uh, my graph G contains a vertex of degree more than K, then I delete this vertex and I decrease the parameter, right? That's exactly the same what I did yesterday. And now if uh, claim is if graph G K is a reducible instance, then it contains at most K square ages, right? Okay, what means irreducible? There's no uh, zero vertices, and then uh, it means that every vertex is of degree at most k, so I cannot have more than k square edges. And also in the theorem I say that it's at most k square plus k vertices, so what happening here, so I have a vertex cover of size k, and every vertex in this vertex cover has at most k neighbors outside, right? So I have at most k square neighbors outside, this is independent set plus k, the size of the vertex cover. And this bound, is very, uh, this bound is not tight. I will explain in the next lecture how to apply more interesting uh, uh, integer linear program te based on uh, te techniques uh, on uh, to obtain a better kernel. So this is a, just a not precise. Okay, let's take a look at another problem. It's a uh, h-click cover. So what uh, happening in the h-click cover? So I have a graph G, as usual, parameter k, and now I want to understand if there are at most k clicks in this graph, which cover all the edges. One edge can be covered by several clicks, this I, I, I don't care. So the only thing I, I want that or every edge belongs to some of the clicks. So on this example here I have a graph, and I have uh, three clicks, covering all ages. And I think uh, it's impossible to cover this graph by two clicks. Right? Okay, so I claim that uh, H-click cover admits a kernel with a two to the K number of vertices. Right, how come? Okay, so uh, again, the first reduction rule seems to be the same, uh, and uh, it's trivial, right? If I have a vertex of degree zero, this vertex, it will not cover any any edge. It will not belong to any clicks, or it, so it's, it's useless, right? So I just remove this. Okay, so the second rule requires some thinking. So why it works, right? So what is the rule? If I have an edge UV such that close neighborhoods of these two vertices are equal, what are the close neighborhoods of two vertices?
I have a vertex u, vertex v, So this is example when uh, I have two vertices which close neighborhoods are equal, right? So every vertex adjacent to this vertex is also adjacent to this vertex and also these vertices are adjacent. Sometimes these vertices are also called twins. Okay, so if I have two vertices which are twins, then my reduction rule is I just contract this edge. Okay, why, and yes, and if this uh, UV was just a singular isolated H, then I also decrease my parameter by one. Okay, why is this happening? Uh, yeah? I, I just uh, take these vertices and I uh, just uh, identify them. Yes, I make them one. Uh, actually, in this also, I just, uh, in this example, uh, uh, I identify these guys. And the neighbors remain the same. And I remove uh, multiple edges, which appears. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so why this uh, rule is sound? Well, first of all, if I have uh, two, vert two twin vertices, which is an edge, isolated edge, right? This isolated edge can be covered by only one clique, which consists of these two vertices. So I have to use this in any case. So I decrease my parameter by one. And if this is not an H, right? So then what's happening? If I able to cover uh, if I'm able to cover uh, with K clicks uh, the reduced solution, I can use exactly the same click to cover the original instance. Right, because what's happening? I just take, a, I, I construct a, 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 from the click, for example, covering the, this vertex, I just construct a new click by adding one more vertex and make it adjacent to all guys. And because these vertices are twins, this click also will cover everything, right? So this rule is sound. This is a reduction rule. Okay, so yes, I with this rule, I, I think I give you the nice and, and short proof, right? I said it's trivial, and for this I just wave my hands. But the best way, just if you don't understand it, just try to think it. It's not complicated. But so if if you need to prove it formally, you just need to write several sentences. Just uh, think about this, right? So, okay, so the, these rules are sound, and now actually I want to say that. Uh, Okay, so I, now I, uh, so that's that's all the rules, and now I want to bound the size of the reducible instance, right? So I apply my rules, and as far as I'm not able to apply my rules, I can say that okay, the size of my graph should be bounded. Okay, suppose that I have a irreducible yes instance, and suppose I have a, so this is a yes instance, so all edges of this instance can be covered by at most k clicks, right? Okay. And then uh, there is a nice trick here. What I'm doing, I'm constructing algebraic representation of uh, these clicks and the vertices. What I'm doing, so for every vertex of the graph, I uh, construct a binary k vector. And this is just characteristic vector of this vertex corresponding to the clicks. So the, the value or the coordinate of the vector is equal, i is equal to one, if and only if this vertex belongs to the click with the number i, right? Okay, so what we know, right? I know that if I have two vertices, which are, if I have two vectors which are equal, what does it mean? It means that the closed neighborhoods of the vertices are the same, right? Because they belong exactly to the same clique. Right? So if, if two vectors are equal, then uh, these guys are queens. And also I know that by reduction rule one, for every vertex V, its neighborhood is non-empty, right? Because I remove the vertices of degree zero. This is one thing. And the second thing, if two vertices U and V are twins, then we should apply reduction rule two. Okay, so... 
This? Yeah, why do they have the same? No, they. This one? They, the first one. If xv is equal to over 2. Okay, uh, so, so what, what, what does it mean that uh, two characteristic vectors of two vertices are equal? I claim that their neighborhoods are the same. Because I take any, so the, the, I take any H of this, uh, or any adjacent vertex of one guy, so the neighbor, right? And it's covered by exactly the same clicks as here. I take, I take any, okay, I take the, the, the vertex V, and I take any vertex uh, W, right? And then I claim that this vertex W is adjacent to V if and only if it's adjacent to U. Why? Well, if this vertex is adjacent to, to, to V, it should be contained in some clique. So all coordinates here should be corresponding to this, the coordinate should be one corresponding to this clique. But uh, because uh, the vectors are the same, this vertex also should be adjacent. Right? So it's, uh, this is the reference. Okay, but then, uh, so this means that all vectors, because of the reduction rules, all vectors should be different, right? But I have a binary vectors of, uh, uh, in dimension k. So I have at most two to, the power, two to the k different vectors. This means that the number of vertices in my graph is at most two to the k. Right, that's a, it's a, it's a nice trick happening. Can you this? Yeah. Uh, this one? Okay, so what I know, so, so we show that all vectors are different. So I have a vectors of dimension k, right? And uh, this is a binary vector. So how many binary, different binary vectors of dimension k can be? Put to the k, right? It's, uh, yep. Sorry? Yes, 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 yes. But uh, then, uh, yes, but, uh, but then uh, what you are doing, right? So you have a reducible graph. And if you have more than two to the k vertices, you say, no, this is no instance. Because it can, because if it was a yes instance, it would contain two to the k, right? So, so your algorithm, it can always say, okay, if it's no, you, 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 you reject, you're happy, right? And if it's yes, yes, then, uh, well, you don't know how to solve the problem, but you know that the size is bounded. Okay. Uh, yeah. More questions, or? Okay. But this means you're saying that this can be solved then in the time, no? Or just apply the rules, then check if it's due to the K, and you're done, no? I apply the rules, and as far as I cannot apply the rules, I look at the instance, and if the instance has more than 2 to the K vertices, I say no. And if it has less than 2 to the K vertices, I say, no, I don't say yes. I say, this is a kernel, right? I don't do anything else. It's a complete complete problem. I cannot solve it, right? View it that way. So uh, what is a polynomial time algorithm? Polynomial time algorithm is a uh, kernelization algorithm which always output you a kernel of constant size, right? It says yes or no. And you can always construct a trivial instance of constant size for your problem, yes or no, right? And now I'm just asking uh, a little bit more, right? I, I know that I cannot solve the problem exactly, but I still run in polynomial time, and basically I look what I still can, can be done in polynomial time. You, so why I'm doing this? View it this way. Suppose you are just lazy, you, you do what is simple, and you postpone a complicated task to, to the future, right? So that's what you do, why you do kernelization. You, you preprocess things, you, you, you keep it, and then maybe you hope that someone in the future will solve the problem for you, right? Or, no, but, but something in your argument because you say that if it's no, okay, it cannot have a... So if, so if I have a reducible instance which, which has more than two to the k vertices, this is the proof, right? I gave you the proof that this uh, instance can be covered by k clicks, which means that it's, there's no solution there. So, yeah, that's... I'm always speaking about yes and no decision problems. For which problem? Like, like the core problem of, of this. Uh, what is the core problem? I mean the core problem, like the, the no instance. Uh-huh. Ah, okay, so, yeah. So a, a, a language. No, 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 but, uh, but for decision problems, what you always ask, yes or no, right? 
And I give it, uh, and so, so when you ask, in the, we want to design a polynomial algorithm for decision problem, to solve decision problem, right? You say yes or no. Problem is satisfiable, no. Graph contains Hamiltonian path, no, right? And now I'm asking, uh, can you, the, I give you the problem, can you either tell me no, or can you reduce the problem? It still can be no, right, at the end. But you, this you don't know. Okay, so now, so uh, actually I claim that uh, uh, FPT is exactly the same. Okay, so now I claim that FPT is exactly the same as kernelization, right? This is a, a little bit strange result. Okay, so, so, for, so far what we know, for parameterized problem, we can have one of the following things. The problem can admit a polynomial kernel, right? This we saw vertex cover, point line cover. We know that the problem can admit a kernel exponential, right? And also, it uh, likely could be that the problem admits no kernel at all, right? So if you believe that there is a problem which are not fixed parameter tractable, then definitely there are problems which do not admit any kernel at all. Why? Because if a problem admits a kernel, right, I'm able in polynomial time to reduce the size of the problem which is bounded by some function of k, then I just run brute force on this bounded, uh, on the reduced instance, and I can solve the problem in FPT. Right? So definitely uh, there are problems uh, which do not admit a polynomial kernel. But uh, there is a, so, and as I say, if uh, the problem admits a kernel, then the problem should be fixed parameter tractable. But uh, what is a funny thing, uh, that if the problem is fixed parameter tractable, it also admits a kernel. Right? And this is, uh, the, the first time you see this result, it's uh, strange, you don't believe it. But the proof is extremely simple. So the proof is the following. I have a theorem. Q is FPT, then it means that Q admits a kernel, right? Okay, what does it mean that uh, problem Q is uh, fixed parameter tractable? It means that deciding, uh, so I take any instance I, K of K, so deciding if the strings belong to K can be done in time, some function of K times I power C, where C is some constant, right? Uh, F of K times polynomial of the input size. Definition of FPT. For some, so there is some algorithm doing this. Okay, so how I design a canonization algorithm? I run my algorithm I power C plus one times. This is still polynomial running time, right? C is a constant, so I power C plus one is a polynomial, right? Now, if uh, my algorithm terminates, it means it found the solution. Then I found the solution in polynomial time, I'm happy, right? And I, if I didn't find solution, if my algorithm doesn't terminate in i power c plus 1 steps, then I just stop it and output i comma k, and I say that this is a kernel. Why, right? Well, why this is a kernel? Okay, so what I, I know, right? So the algorithm, so the problem is solvable in time f of k times i power c. And since the algorithm didn't terminate, this means that this f of k times i power c should be larger than the number of steps my algorithm did. Right? This means that f of k is larger than the size of i. This means that this is a kernel. Right? It's a little bit like cheating, right, somehow, but this thing is very important to, to, to understand that uh, if my problem is FPT, then it has a kernel, right? It doesn't say, actually, uh, and, 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 and this algorithm only shows that if my problem is FPT, then my problem has a kernel of exponential size. And there is a very interesting life, uh, actually, and so because uh, you saw that some problems, they have a polynomial kernel. And for some problems, it's actually possible to show. There is a now developed uh, techniques of low bounds, which, sh uh, which, which, which is used to show that uh, certain problems do not admit a problem of polynomial size. And for example, so this problem, the H click cover, so where we had a kernel of size, uh, So we have a kernel of size 2 to the k. Actually, uh, there is a nice and quite complicated proof which shows that this is, that's it. So there's no kernel of smaller size. So this bound is actually, this simple algorithm is optimal. So there, well, up to some con uh, assumptions and complexity theory. Yep. 
Okay. So, so now all game, yes? <laughs> this one, where, where Marcus? This one. This one? Oh, sorry. Ah. Okay. So what? So what I'm saying? So I, I run my algorithm in I C plus one steps. Yeah. Okay. So this, so this one. But if I just uh, I don't understand the question because if I just divide by I power C this and this. Ah, okay. Ah, okay. So I know, so I know that my problem is solvable in time f of k i power c by definition, right? And if I run it i c plus one number of steps, and I still didn't terminate. So why I didn't terminate? Look, it's a, it's a, it's a little bit of brain. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a, yeah, yeah. It looks very simple, but somehow, yeah, it's a. Okay, so now, so the, the, the whole game which people play in kernelization, right? So since it's uh, just asking if the problem uh, admits a kernel or a node, it's the same as is the problem FPT or a node, right? It's not so interesting, right? So why we need kernelization? But the interesting thing uh, starts to appear. When we start to distinguish if I have a kernel of polynomial size or a node, right? So, for example, let's take a look what's happening with, again, uh, our uh, another favorite problem, D heating set. So in the heating set, a reminder from yesterday, I have a universe U and I have a family of sets of size at most D over the universe and I have a parameter integer K. And then the question is, is there a subset of elements of size at most K which hits every set in the family? Okay, so let me, let's just start uh, doing from three heating sets because for two heating sets it's vertex cover, we know what's happening, right? And for, and uh, usual thing, right? I just uh, have an algorithm for two heating sets and I try to imitate, sorry? Of heating set. Again, I have a sets of size at most D and I want to find at most K elements which hits, intersect every set from the family. Okay. Uh, just uh, we had algorithm for two, two hitting set is the vertex cover, right? It's, uh, and then uh, for vertex cover we had a kernel, so I just tried to imitate the same kernel for three hitting set. So uh, isolated vertices are usually for vertex cover. If vertex is incident with k plus one ages, it should be in the solution. This is a vertex cover. And I try to do the same for three hitting set. Okay. What uh, will be the first type of uh, argument? If an element is not contained in any of the sets, it cannot hit anything, so this element I can safely remove. Okay, now, if the element is contained in k plus one sets, such that the only intersections of any pair of the sets is exactly in this element, then I would say that this element should go into the solution, right? Because if it doesn't go to the solution, I still have to hit, to hit all these k plus one sets, and, I, and because uh, besides uh, that, uh, besides uh, v, they do not intersect. I have to spend k plus one vertices just to hit them. So this is a, this is a degree rule. But then things become a bit messy because maybe still uh, I also can have two elements, right? And if these two elements are contained in k plus one sets such that uh, these two elements are the only intersection of these two sets, then uh, at least one of these vertices should be in the solution. Again, the, the same argument, right? Okay, so let me just design reduction rules according to these uh, observations. One reduction rule, if an element is not contained in any set, delete it. If an element is contained in k plus one sets, uh, then uh, what I'm doing, I, again, uh, my reduction rule will be, I'm really sorry about this. It's, uh, it's some kind of memory in the stick. So it uh, it's remembers how many times I click and then, okay. And so then, so what, what will be my trick? So I, I make a new set, which consists of this uh, only element. 
right? So when I create a set which consists of one element, and in the new instance, this means that I always have to select this element, right? I still have to hit the set which is exactly consists of one element. So I, this I have to do. And then I can delete all the sets because now I hit all of them, right? So I can delete all of them. And the same trick I'm doing for the uh, third case, when I have two elements uh, which are contained in K plus one elements, uh, and actually this is the only intersection of these two elements. And then uh, I can do, I can make a new set uh, out of these two elements, delete all, uh, delete all remaining sets. So this again, this is a, more or less the same uh, bus uh, kernelization for vertex cover. I'm doing just for three head, three hitting set, but now, for vertex cover, it was quite easy to estimate the size of the uh, uh, kernel. And now, so if I have a reducible instance, uh, so how many sets can be in a reducible instances? And then how many uh, sets are in reducible instances? So the answer is uh, k cube, but the proof starts to become messy. And actually, I will just try to sketch you the proof. And uh, uh, in just in, in, and I will do it. So this is a, that will be a completely silly things which I will do because. Uh, the, but uh, I will do this just in all for you in order to appreciate how good mathematics can be really helpful even for such things, right? Okay. So once again, I have a reducible instance. Now I want to estimate how many sets in this reducible instance. Okay. So I claim that it's something of order k cube. Why? Suppose not. Suppose I have a irreducible instance with more than k 100, and 100 is just some big number, uh, k cube sets. And then uh, I'm taking a maximal family of uh, pairwise non-intersecting sets in this set. Right? And I claim, first of all, that the number of this, uh, the size of this set should be at most k plus 1. Right? Because if I have more k plus 1 non-intersecting sets, to hit each of them, I need another vertex. So I need uh, to hit all of them, I need at least k plus one vertices. So if I found this set of vertices, uh, if, if this family of sets, I, I can say no for sure, right? This is not a yes instance. Okay, then I just pick up a set uh, which intersects most of the elements from the set of the whole family. And then the, 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 the horror starts because the, now I, I have to prove that, uh, that uh, in that case I can, uh, I, I, so if because this set intersects a lot of uh, sets from the family, then uh, in this case uh, one of the reduction rules should be applied. And because I also have to prove it for three sets, for two sets, it's still possible, but uh, it, it's also, it also looks like what we, what we're trying to do now, we just try to reinvent reinvent a bicycle. Why I'm saying this? Because look, so all this type of results, it smells very much like a result from extremal graph theory. Because I have some structure, and this structure it satisfies some conditions, right? So I say my graph is irreducible. But this is also very easy to express what means my graph is irreducible, right? So every, uh, so if I have a k plus one, this sets which intersects in one element, then it, it shouldn't happen. So th this, this is a set of instances which excludes some structure. And of course, uh, people were doing these things a lot in 1960s and 70s. And luckily, there is much more elegant way to kernelize a de-heating set. And actually, we just have to look at the problem from a slightly different angle. It's more or less the same. It's the same bus reduction rule, but it has a nice and classical name. It's called Sunflower Lemma. So Sunflower Lemma is an old result from 1960 of Erdos and Rado. So what is a sunflower? So a sunflower is the following thing. If I have a K sets, they form a sunflower if all sets formed by removing from set the, the common intersection are disjoint. So on this example, look, so I have four sets and they have a common intersection. This is, a, this is called the center of the flower. And all other guys, they are completely disjoint. They are called petals. Right? The concept is clear. And it really looks like a sunflower. 
Now, what uh, Ergosh and Rado proved that if the size of a set system is greater than p minus one power d times d, and it contains only sets of size at most d, so if I have instance of d heating set, then the system contains an a sunflower with p petals. Furthermore, in this case, such a sunflower can be founded in polynomial time. Once again, what does it say? It says that if I have a lot of uh, sufficiently many sets in my set, then there should live a sufficiently large sunflower. Right? This is exactly an extremal set theory result. And uh, the proof of this lemma is nice. And actually, because it's a very old lemma and it's quite commonly used, there are a lot of uh, nice uh, and different proofs of this result. And actually, I don't want to spoil the thing. So, uh, look, if you never saw this book, Extremal Combinatorics of Stasis Juchner, please take a look at that. It's a nice bedtime reading. It's a very nicely written with a lot of uh, elegant proofs. It's like a, just a strongly recommend this. Okay. So now my reduction rule is the following. So if I have a k plus one sets which form a sunflower, then what's happening, right? So what I know, I know that uh, at least one of the vertices in the center of the sunflower should be in the heating set, right? Because if none of the vertices in the center are in the heating set, then to, to heat all the guys, all the petals of the sunflower, I need k plus one elements. Right. So then, what I what I'm doing? Uh, I, then I just make a new set from the center of the sunflower, and I remove all these sets from uh, from my family. Or if you, it's better for you to think in terms of hypergraphs, I just construct a new hyper H and I remove all these hyper edges from the hypergraph. Okay, and uh, actually the node, so if the center is empty, it means that I have a, a k plus one disjoint set, then I don't have a solution. And then by sunflower lemma, if I cannot apply this reduction rule, this means that uh, my instance has at most k power d sets, right? Because uh, by the sunflower lemma, if I have more than k, k d times some constants of, of d sets, then I have a sunflower, and then I can apply reduction rule, right? So we really, so, so what, what, what happened here, right? So we just took a nice theorem, lemma from uh, old extremal set theory, and uh, we just apply it in a nice way, and we really avoid all the mess which I try to bring you in with trying to analyze uh, what happening with this and with that, yes? Because it doesn't have G elements, and we just add some random elements to this new edge. Because I mean, you, you have to create Yes, but then uh, look. Uh, so, so what, uh, okay. So, if 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 I have element which doesn't belong to any set, yes, uh, yeah. No, at most d, at most d, at most d. Yeah, yeah. With, uh, you can do it also for the problem with uh, exactly d, but you have to do it, uh, you have to do a little bit different deduction rule. With with at most d, it's much easier and it's much. Yeah. Announcer. Okay, so this means that uh, d heating set admits a kernel with k d sets. Uh, okay, and uh, but d here is fixed. Yes. yes, it's polynomial, right? So d is uh, like d is a, a fixed value, but if it's part of the of the parameter, <laughs> then 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 then, 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 then uh, so the problem doesn't ad ad admit a kernel at all, right? Okay, it's not. Uh, it's like a dominating so set. It's like uh, no. It's become like a dominating set, and dominating set is W to hard. Um, so, uh, so this is a. And the other question you can ask also. I, I gave you so how how many sets are here? But also the actually this kernel gives me a solution with K D elements. Do you see why? Okay, maybe just uh, just say think. Exactly, and because it's a, yes, and because, yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah, good, yeah. And actually, uh, it's possible to improve uh, uh, this kernel into a number of elements to k power d minus 1. But it requires a walk, additional walk. Okay, let's just, uh, so, uh, as usual. As usual, so we have, um, 
to technique. So let's try to see how we can uh, apply this technique to a very similar problem. It's called D set packing. So D set packing is I have a universe U, I have a family S and uh, integer K. And now I ask if there is a subset of sets which are pairwise disjoint. So in this example, I have four sets and these two sets are two a uh, packing of size 2 and actually these two sets also are packing of size 2, right? So this is a, a, a kind of dual problem to heating set. Okay, so let's just, uh, you know, in order to understand uh, how to do the things, sometimes it's again, it's useful to do uh, silly things, right? So let's just, uh, so what is a two set packing? Two set packing is a matching problem on graphs. We know that we can solve matching in polynomial time. So forget about this, somehow don't think about polynomial time, just try to see how we can do a kernel for matching, right? Uh, it's a silly exercise, but it will help us to solve already three set packing, which is NP-complete. Okay. Oh, what I did. Okay. Okay. Now, if my graph contains a vertex V, which degree is at least 2K plus 2, then I claim that at least uh, then any H incident to vertex V can be deleted. How come? This is. I have a vertex V and it has uh, uh, at least K plus two incident ages. Right? And now suppose I have a matching in this graph. So how this matching can go? Okay, one age can be, for example, incident to vertex V and then, uh, well, maybe like that, like that, like that, whatever, right? And now I'm claiming that I just take any vertex if I remove it then nothing changes. Well, if I remove a, uh, sorry, if I remove uh, any H, then the new graph will contain a matching of size K in if and only if this graph contains matching of size at most K, right? Uh, okay, so what's happening? So su suppose I just take any H and I remove it. If that was H not of the matching, then nothing happened, right? And then if this was an H of the matching, then, how many ages incident to vertex V also incident to the vertices of the matching? Well, there I have K plus two ages. So it means that there exists an H incident to V, which a second endpoint doesn't belong to any endpoints of the matching, right? So I can put this H into the matching, right? So this means I, I just, uh, I can ease, if I have a vertex of high degree, I can always uh, decrease uh, its degree by removing my one H and nothing will be changed. Agree? Okay, but then as far as we realize what's happening for matching, it's, it's very easy to see what's happening for this set packing, right? Because if my set contains a sunflower with at least D times K plus two petals, exactly the same arguments, right? One of these uh, sets can be deleted. Right? Okay. So then, so basically, what what's happening, right? So uh, now I apply sunflower lemma. So I don't have a. So it means that uh, I don't. So in my graph, I don't have a sunflower with more than this number of petals after reduction rule. So my reduction rule is again, I find a sunflower, and if the sunflower contains more than two d times k plus two petals, I just remove any set from this uh, sunflower, right? And then I apply sunflower lemma for this type of gra graph, and I know that this, uh, by sunflower lemma, this irreducible instance contains at most k power d sets, right? So it's a... Okay, I put some exercises here, they are on slides, but we also agreed with Thomas that uh, there were too many exercises yesterday, so today that's will be the. the that. Okay, anyone solve all four exercises from yesterday? 
Anyone solve three exercises? Very good. Two. Zero. Okay, then, uh, okay, then, I, okay, then, uh, okay, so solve exercises from yesterday, today as well, right? Please. Okay, uh, then uh, it says I skip the exercises and just summon up what I just was teaching you this hour. We, def we start speaking about kernelizations, and we spoke about simple kernels, so like for vertex cover, point line cover, H click cover, and also we realized that there are polynomial kernels and there are exponential kernels, and actually uh, it makes uh, really uh, the day different. Also, FPT is exactly equal to kernelization, and then also we started to dive into tools which can be used to design polynomial time kernels. So this was a sunflower lemma. Right? So if you forget everything what I spoke today, at least these things, I hope, will remain. Okay, so we still have like 15 minutes, right? Uh, okay, so let's just start, uh, oops. A little bit more advanced canalization. Yep. Yes. This is a very nice question, and people and people and people, no, no, people do care. And again, as with polynomial time algorithms, uh, it's important thing. And uh, so, sometimes they're linear, sometimes they're not linear. And uh, but look, uh, I, I just want to give you just, just some uh, glimpse of what, what's happening. But this is an important question, and this is an important question I completely abandon. Right, but no, but definitely, if you if 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 you want to implement your algorithm, kernelization algorithm, you care about running time, right? Because the kernelization also gives you an algorithm that runs a polynomial in the instance and then plus the kernel. That yes, yeah, 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 yeah. But this polynomial. If it is linear, you give you an algorithm that is very efficient. No, no, yeah, yeah, but, but if you have a polynomial, this poly so uh, what is the polynomial running time of the algorithm? It's important. Absolutely, but look. So far, I cannot tell you about everything, right? Okay. And there are another tricks and another things how people do efficient polynomial time algorithms. That's also, and also it's also not very clear. So we don't know, for example, uh, uh, if I can do fast uh, kernelization, but maybe it will be worse kernelization, for example, this type of things. So what's happening there? No, it's in, 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 interesting things happening there. Uh, no, no, no. We also in the book. It's just still. Uh, Okay, so uh, you have to be, uh, so, so for many kernels, it's, it's not so interesting because what you can do, it's like for vertex cover, right? For vertex cover, we'll have a better kernel than k square, right? But uh, first you can start to construct a very fast bad kernel and then start working with the second kernelization on this kernel. So for many problems, maybe you can have, you, not maybe, you can have this type of chain of algorithms. But still, no, it's, it's, it's important and interesting question. And, just, and I don't speak about this just because I'm, just, I'm not able to teach you everything in the world. Okay, so the, the, the plan for the more advanced things which I want to talk about kernelization is uh, I will speak about crown decomposition. And again, so this is uh, because kernelization, it seems that many types of kernelization algorithms are really related to extremal graphs or extremal set theory just because uh, I'm doing reduction rules and I have to say something to the, uh, about graph or about system or about geometrical objects which do not, uh, which, uh, do not contain some specific structure. Because if they contain some specific structure, I can apply reduction rules. So there are, uh, and this is uh, somehow still, uh, it, so obviously there is some connection between that. But uh, what really deeply happened, I'm not sure we still understand. So it's, uh, but uh, still, so the tools from uh, extremal graph theory are very nice. And actually, so for crown decomposition, it's based on Koenig theorem, one of the oldest theorem in, in graph theory about m m matching and vertex cover and bipartite graphs, for example. I will be using this, I will give examples for vertex cover and max set. And then I will start also to do the same plan for vertex cover, and I will do linear programming, also a very classical Nemhauser the Trotter theorem about uh, rounding integer linear program for vertex cover. That uh, will be another thing. And again, yeah, I can use this result to obtain a polynomial kernel. Okay, so...
Okay, so okay, that's what I will do today. So I will just tell you the things which I hope you already knew from some course in discrete mathematics. I will just speak about matching, but then how to apply this matching, I will start on Thursday about this. Okay, so what is the Koenig theorem? So from 1916s, it's uh, that I, if I have a bipartite graph, then in this bipartite graph, the number of vertices in a minimum vertex cover is equal to the number of edges in a maximum matching. Right? This is a very old result, and also it's actually it's also shows that vertex cover is solvable in polynomial time on bipartite graphs. And uh, actually, uh, there is uh, also algorithmic version of this result, right? So if I use Hopford, Hop, Hopcroft Carve algorithm from 1972, which computes matching in polynomial time on, on bipartite graphs, right? Uh, so in, in this running time, so then it's also this algorithm also computes uh, vertex cover. And bipartite graphs, right? This is a and another famous uh, theorem, which I also will be using a lot uh, for this. It's a uh, Hall's marriage theorem from 1935, and uh, it says that if I have a bipartite graph with bipartition A and B, and then it also tells me when this graph has a matching of what size, right? And then uh, this graph has a matching of A into B. And by matching A into B, what does it mean? So I have A, I have B, and matching of A into B, it means that every vertex in A is used in the matching, right? So then we say that uh, a graph uh, G has a matching of A into B, if and only if, for every subset of X, if I take the neighbors of X in B, then the size of this neighborhood is always at least on this one. Right? These are the two classical results which I use for them. And again, so by using again Hopcroft and Carp, I, uh, I can uh, compute in this running time uh, uh, algorithm which finds uh, either matching which saturates A, so it's matching which covers all vertices of A, or I can find inclusion minimal set X of I, which doesn't satisfy this condition. So this theorem is very constructive and there is a quite efficient algorithm, just al algorithmic version of this theorem. Okay, so this is uh, what, uh, and I will, I will start from here on, on Thursday. So just, so, okay, so if any questions for today, yes? Oh, come on, it's uh, oh, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, yes, it's a usual joke, uh, right? Okay, uh, okay, but so it's marriage because uh, the, the first application, I think, considered in the paper, is you have boys, you have girls, right? And the, the ages corresponds to preferences, right? So you don't want to marry everyone, right? But you have several girls which you're happy to marry, and there are also se several girls which are happy, well, which are happy to pick up these guys as husbands. And then you want to find the maximum set of uh, pairs which will be happier. That's, that's my explanation why it's called marriage. Maybe it's, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes? Okay, then, again. Okay. <laughs>